Hi, and welcome to New God Sunday School. I'm Tom Scholey, author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, and I Am Stan, a graphic biography of the legendary Stan Lee. There's a link in the show notes below where you can pre-order that book, and you can also pre-order the softcover edition of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. When the storm of battle is over, who will be left on the glory boat? The new gods, Orion, Light Ray, Extra, Manhunter battles Mr. Meek. So yeah, this is issue six of New Gods, and yeah, we're we're deep into the good stuff. Issue five is where you know all these series start heating up. With issue six, uh, it's red hot. It's just um, this is just a, a phenomenal comic. Just great cover, inked by Vince Coletta, and you know you got you got the mummy on there. You know, very intriguing visual. You know, part of you know Kirby's you know bag of tricks. We have these sort of uh, Lovecraftian sea monsters, and then, and then, yeah, like a mummy on, on an old ship. I first read this story uh, in this collection, which has issue five and six, all as one story with this really nice uh, wraparound cover that Jack Kirby drew in the 80s when this reprint came out. You now, with issue five and issue six paired up, um, they, they really do read as like one complete unit. And so you end up with basically like a 49 page graphic novel, you know, so uh, and that might be the first that might be the first New Gods I ever read was that that um, reprint. So, I mean, just makes an amazing first impression. And I was just, you know, ready to hunt down every last issue of this series, you know, after reading this. You get a, a nice complete story. So here's here's the second half, which also is a great reading experience in its own right. The, the pacing, uh, you know, this time around, this reading, I was really impressed with the pacing. It, it unfolds, the story unfolds at a pace that's just very different from from other superhero comics. Even even Kirby's own work at at Marvel, you know, just it never never you know flowed with this kind of rhythm. And still, even though it's part of a larger narrative, it feels very complete and it feels very uh, visceral, and, and that you're like in there with them, and much more akin to the pacing we would see in a movie than in a sort of you know typical mid-century superhero comic. Bring apocalypse to Earth. This terrible command by Darkseid has been done. The Deep Six, mystic mutators of the deep, have resurrected Leviathan, symbol of ancient disasters, which can only be stopped by the glory boat. We have this um, very uh, inventive, uh, very three-dimensional angle on this sort of, uh, you know, super whale monster, this... Uh, you know, sort of, you know, b- biblical behemoth, uh, this Leviathan on a collision course with this boat. One one thing from the reprint that that was, to my mind, a a bit of a misstep was, um, I feel that the final page of issue five, put next to the final page, I put next to the first page of issue six. It's a little bit redundant. I, I don't really like the way it reads. I feel like you needed like another uh, like another page to kind of clear the palette before you go back to like another shot of this, you know, giant pink behemoth. But we're on a collision course. And then we get we get an unforgettable Jack Kirby double page splash. This is a sea beast which dwarfs anything seen in the ocean since the dawn of time. Beneath its throat is a giant ram, which cruelly pierces the ship as its gargantuan tusks follow to rip apart the remaining tonnage of steel. An abandoned ship, this this boat is just like completely torn apart sideways, just, uh, you know, titanic, kind of like, uh, you know, widescreen epic stuff. And it's um, a lot of the imagery and the storytelling in this issue is very Freudian, uh, very Jungian. It really is stuff that just comes from the depths of the subconscious, which is, uh, you know, where so, mo- so much of its power derives. Uh, a lot of things happen in this story that are really, really incredible and really amazing and, and just, just sort of perfect storytelling decisions. But it's, I, I don't understand how you could sort of arrive at some of these things in sort of like a, 
you know, a um, logical A, B, C, D kind of way. They seem, they seem like the sort, you know, dream imagery, the sort of thing that would, that would emerge from the, the, the unconscious mind and, uh, and, and therefore, you know, it, it, it packs a punch and, and is not derivative. You know, Kirby has sort of invented this, you know, really crazy looking sea monster. We're getting it from like very uh, unconventional angles and we're seeing it sort of rip and tear through the sea. It destroys a submarine. And then I uh, just, I mean, great storytelling here. You have the, the lifesaver from the SS Aurora where they were. And these open pages just makes the whole thing just like a really nice, like inviting experience. Just, just a really great, you know, having, having Mike Royer on board, edited, written, and drawn by Jack Kirby, inked, brushed, and blackened by Mike Royer, Having Mike Royer on board is just, um, he really was the right guy at the right time. He sort of, you know, uh, you know, came around to, to, to work with Jack when Jack was at his best and sort of, you know, delivered Jack at his most unfiltered. And you get the bonus of, his, of when Mike Royer inks a Jack Kirby comic, he also does the lettering. So again, you get a much more unified whole. And Mike Royer, you know, he's known as an inker, but I, I think he's one of the most stylish and inventive letterers that that ever worked in comics three people at war with themselves drift helplessly in a raft towards a rendezvous with orion and the incredible horrifying final war between the new gods and so we get this sort of set up this little drama of three people on a life raft and then they get joined by orion and it's it's kind of reminiscent of that hitchcock movie where it was like you know a bunch of people on a life raft for for the entirety of the movie sort of, you know, settling their little drama. And so Orion is like very aloof, this sort of god. At first they think he's a Polaris missile firing out of the of the sea, but um, they assume he's some sort of new Navy frogman. But, and he, he talks to them, like, again, I'm, I'm always sort of, uh, you know, backseat driving and second guessing these things when I read them. It's just, um, you know, for me as, as a creator, um, you know, I read these things for enjoyment, but also as a learning experience. And my, my editorial brain... And, and, and my creative brain can't help but, you know, try to participate. And so just looking this over, I'd, I probably would have withheld most of Orion's dialogue and thought balloons. I would have um, sort of, because they're like, okay, who is this guy? What's his deal? And he's very, very aloof and austere. And I think it would be really cool to sort of, at least in the beginning, present him as sort of this like silent presence. And so sort of like, you know, every chapter you're sort of reintroducing the story. And it would be kind of cool to introduce him as like, from their perspective, where it's like, who is this guy? What's his deal? Is he going to hurt us? Like, what's going on? And, and, you know, he's just sort of going about his task. Now, Kirby did it his way and, 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 you know, probably, you know, probably for the best, but, but that's just, that's just sort of my thought, like kind of imagining this sequence. If Orion maybe wasn't, wasn't quite as talkative, you know, at least in the very beginning. And so he creates this like magnetic bond between the life raft and, and his, uh, astro harness, his astro force equipment, uh, so he can sort of tow them. Mother Box is leading him somewhere, and Mother Box is leading him here. Wisely or not, their choice is made. Perhaps Mother Box, with her link with the source, leads us all to our fate. And fate proves to be an ugly, misshapen craft made of aged wood with a bound, manlike figure for a mast. Ping, 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 ping. That figure, Mother Box, indicates it's alive. Like I love every line of dialogue. I love the I love the captions. The, the the writing is great. The inking is great. The line work is great. The storytelling is great. The costumes, the characters, the inventiveness, the action, the the sci-fi, the the philosophy. Uh, sort of um, the the father and son are sort of you know arguing about about war and peace and and. Uh, pacifism, joining the war, avoiding the war, which which would have been the Vietnam War at this point, um, with with uh, you know the daughter or sister sort of caught in the middle, and so they arrive at this boat, and again it's like another another you know image from a dream, like this this boat is very intriguing. It it seems like a literal houseboat. It's like um, you know I I can't tell what era it's even from. It's or, or what it's supposed to be. It doesn't look like any boat I've ever seen. It looks like looks like some strange, you know, wooden geometry from a dream. Uh, again, sometimes Kirby draws something and you're like, where's he getting this from? And then you see, you know, some photo of maybe 
like a like a uniform from World War II or some airplane or some old boat or something where it's like, oh, oh, he's modeling it after this. But but I mean, I I don't really I don't know what he's pulling from. I'm I'm thinking he's he's pulling from the unconscious. This is just like imagery that's just coming out, and it's so perfect. And it's, uh, you know, unlike anything I've ever seen, is it's just so perfect. So he shows up at this sort of wooden boat, half, like, like um, death barge, part boat, part house, part pyramid with a mummy on top of it. It's just, I'm just eating this stuff up. Well, there's one way to strip those bonds away, Orion's way, the way of the Astro Force. With experienced handling, the Astro Force brackets its targets, stinging and stimulating the tight coils. The coils become alive and threatening. They reach for Orion. Kelp, living steel-fibered kelp, another mutation of the Deep Six. And I was reading some Kirby comic from the 60s that had, you know, sort of like living, booby-trapped, steel-fibered kelp. I think it might have been a Captain America story uh, where he's sort of swimming past some of that stuff. But it's, it's, it's a motif Kirby's been playing with. Well, 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 so the smiling lamb decided to try his hand among the wolves after all. Yours is a sorry welcome to Earth, Light Ray. I see that your first brush with war and the Deep Six has been little short of disastrous. True, Orion, but though war is the game of tragedy, I shall live to give it greater meaning. We're at issue six. The last time Orion and and Light Ray were in the same place, it was issue one. So think about that. We're six issues in... Uh, into a bi-monthly series. So it's basically been like a year. And, and now finally this, this sort of duo, you know, teams up. But again, I love the, the pace at which this series and the connected series unfold. It's, it's just so satisfying, so naturalistic, much more akin to, you know, every other art form we experience. It just feels, it just feels right. It feels like these are the, 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 the pace at which it unfolds is a rhythm that is very comfortable for human beings to, to sort of consume a story. It doesn't, it's urgent, but it's moving forward. Light Ray has entered the fray. He's no longer in sort of, you know, new Genesis super space. He is now part of, he's now part of the war on earth. And here they are together. Seeing, uh, seeing them both with their red hair makes me wonder uh, if, if they might possibly be brothers or half brothers. It it at least suggests a, a kinship, but um, I hadn't really thought about that before this reading, because I always sort of read Light Ray's hair as blonde and Orion's as red, uh, but but yeah, it's it's the exact same tone. And just like Kirby in full Kirby mode, and so the 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 gods are sort of having their their god story with their god language, and then. The, the, uh, the regular folk are kind of like, hey, what's going on? Farley Sheridan's the name. Perhaps you've heard of Sheridan Industries. To put it simply, we've been shipwrecked. Oh yes, a handshake, a relic from your ancestral fear of the next man's hidden weapon. That age of anxiety hasn't passed, as you know. That's all too true. Don't let the puppy get you down, mister. I'm not proud of it, but he's my son, Richard, and this is my daughter, Lynn. If I don't tell you, I'm sure my dad will. I'm a conscientious objector. I don't like war, violence, or killing. Is that right? Well, I know of a place where everybody's like that. Light Ray, come inside. We've got a monstrosity on our hands. I know the Deep Six left it here and swam off to some task. If that task is what I suspect, there's a catastrophe in the making. If I can be of help, buddy, you'll get your chance, buddy. If I succeed here, the Deep Six will be back. The way um, Orion says buddy in that moment reminds me of like, the, sort of the awkwardness that he's, he's kind of trying to echo the, the language of this guy and, and, and buddy, it's like, okay, that's, that's obviously some earth colloquialism. It sort of reminds me of uh, Nixon uh, using the word buddy uh, in, in the Oliver Stone Nixon movie where Anthony Hopkins plays Richard Nixon and, and uh, that's his, his pet name for, for his wife, Pat. Uh, buddy. He calls her Buddy. You'll get your chance, Buddy. The, the story's already rolling through in high style. And then, yeah, you turn the page. You're going in this, in this wooden ship that looks like it might be from like 10,000 years ago. And then you, you go in the door and there's Lovecraftian horror going on. An organic director, the Deep Six, have bred it from sea life. 
and it attacks Orion. And then before Orion can sort of uh, destroy it, Light Ray does his thing. He starts rearranging its molecules and turns it into a cube, a technoactive cube. Now this thing, uh, um, I think that thing is a sender. It computes and sends direction signals. So it's this weird creature that the Deep Six have created from some form of sea life um, is, is, is the brains of Spawn. It's the brains of that uh, giant pink Moby Dick. You know, that biblical Leviathan, that, that variation on, on, on the same you know, whale that, that swallowed Jonah. Um, this is its brain. This is what's directing it, telling it where to go. So light ray turns it into a cube, turns it into some, you know, uh, sort of like breaks it down, purifies it, and, you, and uses his mother box. Everybody's got their own mother box, and, and everybody's is different, and, and his is on his forehead, and he's turning it into... Th this beam from mother box will make that imprint upon it, the more sophisticated, unified, and technoactive image of a caller. So this thing has been sending the Leviathan off to destroy ships all through the sea to just, you know, bring apocalypse to earth, bring terror to earth. And he set it to, to call it back. It will reverse the course of the sea beast and the deep six and bring them back here. We've arranged a battle fit for the new gods. And nice little, you know, side view cutaway of like above the water, below the water, some new NATO ship. Again, I've never seen a ship that looks like that, so I don't know if Kirby's just in sort of full imagination mode, or or if maybe you know maybe there there is something out there that that looks kind of like that. We have the um, Deep Six's Manta sled, which is pretty cool. Again, uh, you know these amazing shots. The from the side, this thing looks insane, and then this sort of flipping you know tail thing. And when I see like a panel like this, this is not the most beautifully drawn panel I've ever seen. It's um, you know, it, it wouldn't catch your interest, but it's like this, this is how you make a comics masterpiece. And you just like every, th every image is sort of the right image and perfectly chosen. And it doesn't have to be, you know, some big flashy affair. This, this communicates very clearly. And I just, I love the way Kirby is able to know when to like, you know, go like, you know, full on, you know, rendered detail and spectacle and when to get almost like diagrammatic. So they're searching, Light Ray is sending light down into the ocean to, to check for the deep six, but, but the powers of mutation protect Jafar of the deep six. Instant adaptation enables his body to bend Light Ray's beams and render him invisible. Orion's with Light Ray, so that's how he got free. And so as uh, Orion and Light Ray are securing the per perimeter, our, uh, you know, human cast, the Sheridans are back on this boat, and it's rocking and rocking. And I know, you know, a boat was like a big deal for Jack Kirby. Um, you know, he was on a boat from, from the U.S. to Europe uh, where he got, like, really seasick, and then he was on a boat from Europe back to the U.S., again, really seasick, you know, during World War II. So, like, you know, boats are just, um, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're obviously part of the mass consciousness, the mass imagination, but I, I, I think they have like a, spe you know, mean a something, mean something special to, to Kirby. They look decent enough. They haven't harmed us, have they? What, what are you jumpy about? We've got Lynn with us, remember? I'm worried about her safety. Must you always bring me into your bickering? There, you've upset your sister. I thought our yacht trip would help you think things out, but you won't change. You'll never fight when duty demands it. Farley Sheridan, I'm thinking of other Jack Kirby characters. There's Farley Fairfax uh, in The Demon. And then, yeah, Farley Sheridan here, who looks a lot like uh, billionaire Bill Bates, who's going to show up in a later issue of Forever People. So, you know, K Kirby's definitely got his, like, his types that he draws. And, um, well, at least I fought when my outfit hit the beach at Normandy. I walked into that rain of bullets with the rest of them. Great, Dad, but will you take a look at what's happening in this hold? So, I mean, I think, you know, there's some version of autobiography going on in here. I'm sure, like, you know, Jack Kirby with his World War II experience and, and you know, being at Normandy, he's probably had some version of this conversation, you know, with, with his son and one of his daughters. He's had this, a version of this conversation, probably not as heated or intense, uh, probably not as, as, um, adversarial, but I'm sure, you know, you know, and, and it, it you know, probably would have been a couple years prior to this, you know, that, that sort of, you know, the generation that Kirby's kids were part of had a very different perspective on things than his generation. And 
and so they probably did have similar kind of discussions. I obviously sort of heightened and, and beefed up here. I, I imagine Kirby's a much more understanding father than, than, you know, Farley Sheridan is here. And just sort of the authorial voice of this story uh, seems to back that up. And, and, you know, and Kirby, you know, this is, um, you know, 1971. These conversations might have been going on in sort of the late 60s. So, so Kirby's generation and, and Kirby himself has had time to sort of process this stuff, sort of process the anti-war movement and and uh, you know, reaction to the war in, in Vietnam, and 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 you know, and and you know, come at you know a, a a a sort of you know nuanced understanding of the issues that that maybe you know people of his generation didn't really have, um, you know, maybe a couple years prior. Last time we were in here, there was you know they last time somebody walked through that door and we turned the page, it was some crazy sea monster. Now we get. This crazy, gleaming, high-tech, um, you know, living but but sort of uh, you know utopian, you know, futuristic thing here. The cube is shooting strange machine-like forms through the walls and decking of this ship. So this old wooden husk is being transformed from the inside. This must be what Light Ray meant by the cube being technoactive. Dad, we've still got the raft. Let's take our chances with the sea. This is developing into a situation we can't take any part in. Okay, okay, with Lynn to consider, it may be a wise move. Of course, it'll give you the chance to run, to run from this unseen enemy, the Deep Six. Richard, Dad, what is that thing? Good Lord! A considerable amount of buildup. We're on to page 15, and now the big confrontation is beginning. And this, you know, sort of beautifully drawn, beautifully colored, beautifully inked, you know, sea beast, uh, you know, climbs onto the bridge. Again, like... We're into the good stuff, and and I mean I love it. And you know, so, as somebody who grew up with Masters of the Universe, this stuff is just uh, you know revelatory. So here we are. So you're petrified with fear, are you? Well, let your vitals churn a bit, you arrogant little soft-skinned slugs. You're in the presence of Jafar of Apocalypse, one of the Deep Six. Don't face him down, Dad. Just back off slowly, carefully. I I. Oh, does great Jafar outrage your standards of beauty? How deplorable. I've spoiled the little party so generously tendered by Orion and Light Ray, your hosts aboard my control ship. Richard, it, it's horrible. I, I can't. Never mind, Dad. Just move. Get out of his way. Too late. It's Jafar's turn to play. Come here. It's reaching for me, and I can't move. I... Ah. Something inside the older man recoils from action. It bends, it breaks, he slumps to the deck. Then, Richard, no, no. Get Dad back to the hold, Lynn. I'll try to buy us some time. You know, Farley Sheridan, you know, he's a lot of talk. Uh, but, you know, when faced with this, you know, sort of undeniable terror, uh, you know, he, he sort of, you know, freezes with fear. Maybe a post-traumatic stress reaction, uh, you know, or maybe all his talk about, being at Normandy, maybe maybe it's you know sort of an inflated story, maybe you know, uh, or or you know you just don't know. You know we're human beings, and and you know you can you can say oh if I were in this situation I'd do this, and when I was in that situation I'd do that. But you know when the time comes you just you just don't know what's going to happen, and and so um, and so Richard springs into action, and uh, stands up to Jafar, obviously out. Uh, outclassed. I, I really enjoy these moments in a Kirby story where somebody like, you know, when Jimmy Olsen, you know, punches the Wolfman or something, when somebody is sort of fighting way out of his league, you know, it's very heroic and things don't go well for Richard. You're no match for Jafar, but even as you die, I'll make of you a symbol of my wrath, a message from the mystic mutators to your new Genesis friends. They'll see your face and know. Mutation, death, vengeance. It's the way of the deep six. Oh my God, what have you done to him? He has no face. Now, I'm of the opinion that, that this is a coloring error, and, and it's an error that's never been corrected. You know, all, all the times they've uh, reprinted this work, they, they haven't corrected it. I, I feel that Jack's intent here isn't that Jafar turns Richard's face into sort of like a silver surfer kind of thing. Uh, you know, he's erasing his face. I feel like the, the image is supposed to be flesh-colored that we're supposed to be seeing a, a fleshy human face completely smoothed out. And so that's sort of the horror of, of, of no face there. And I feel like making him into sort of like a silver surfer, 
you know, un- undercut some of the horror. So I'm, I'm going to, you know, make a quick little attempt to recolor it myself here, you know, through the magic of YouTube. But vengeance has a way of rebounding on those who use it, and Jafar has indulged in it a second too long. Jafar, you mad dog, you've destroyed an innocent. You'll die for this. That voice, it's Orion. The Astro Force blasts out, but Jafar leaps to the sea. I fight best in the water, Orion. I'll meet you there. Uh, another coloring error here. That there's uh, Jafar's foot, but it's sort of colored as if it's a, a background element. Uh, but that that is corrected, at least in in the in the Baxter edition. And I love this sequence. This is you know you're not in Kansas anymore. That's this is where you see like the difference between Kirby's uh, w- why this is like an evolution of his Marvel stuff. Just sort of the 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 visceral quality, the intensity, the taking real stands and ha- making real creative, taking creative risks and 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 you know creating something much more to my taste. Uh, as much as I love that '60s stuff, you'll never reach the sea alive, you toad. Like lethal lightning, the Astro Force strikes Jafar's form again and again, keeping it in the air with every shock. You know, Orion, you know, the hero of the story, is attacking with intent to kill. Uh, and with, with a real intensity and, and just, uh, you know, he, he's, he's an avenging angel. And I love that imagery that, like, sort of fake out of Jafar saying, you know, we're going in the water and that's where our battle's going to go. And maybe, maybe you know, that would have been in, in an issue of one of Kirby's Marvel comics. They would have continued the battle underwater. But Orion's like, fuck that shit. You're not even making it to the water. And he just keeps blasting him again and again. Uh, you know, and, and the... the um, the narrative, you know, carrying some of the storytelling weight, uh, you know, just just very smartly employed. Uh, he's he's just zapping him with bolt after bolt, just you know, uh, like juggling him in the air, and then uh, he sends a bi- uh, you know this big blast, complete destruction. Jafar has paid for his vicious act, and poor young Richard, what did he pay for? And you just get, I mean, just great momentum in here. You get this great like you know, f- somersault he does in the air with the, with his Astro Force equipment. And then he comes back down and lands. And uh, Dark Side's war will raise many such questions and leave many such scars. I see Light Rays come back in time to share this sorry event. So Light Rays back. He's got Richard in his arms. And he takes him in. And Dad is still in his sort of, you know, PTSD uh, situation. And Richard, you know, as it turns out, Richard was not a coward. He was not avoiding war because of, you know, some kind of fear. It was a, you know, a moral stand he took. It was a war that that meant that he wanted no part of, that that he, he didn't believe in, felt felt was, you know, the wrong way to go. And that that obviously he would, you know, defend and, and you know, rise to defend, you know, his family if threatened, but getting involved in some larger, you know, global conflict uh, whose Purpose and 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 morality just just do, does not make any sense to him, uh, you know. It's very different from the way his father was was characterizing him, and obviously had something in him uh, that 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 his father you know wasn't able to have in that in that crucial moment. Come back, where are you taking my brother? To the heart of this boat, where singing atoms are forging a new ending to this day. Rest here, friend. You still have one final moment to transcend your fate. Richard is part of. Uh, part of Light Ray's plan. There's some sort of, you know, mysticism to Kirby's, uh, you know, New God's work, um, you know, as as the as the title would imply. And, you know, a lot of it is about, you know, finding meaning in death um, and, you know, sort of, you know, this uh, representative of, of the faceless, you know, uh, the faceless uh, young people who who die in war and just yeah finding some some he's going to go to cosmic valhalla in the same way that that a new god would as for you girl you're getting out of here this equipment is computed to fly you to rescue and so she flies off in in orion's astro force equipment uh which you know you'll never see again not until the 80s when kirby you know brings it back uh when he starts doing new new god stories but yeah, it's gone from the, the sort of, you know, original 70s series and, uh, you know, probably makes it a little easy. You know, it, Orion never looks quite as cool without it, but I'm sure it's easy, easier to draw. And, and I'm sure, you know, Kirby expected it to come back eventually. He didn't he didn't think that the series would get canceled out from under him. In my early days as a comics creator, I did, uh, you know, come up with a story of whatever happened to Orion's Astro Harness. And I had like a little story of, you know, of Lynn and, and, and you know, how, how his... Uh, 
Astro Harness eventually comes back to him. And now she's off, uh, you know, the final, the final apocalyptic battle is about to start and the sea is being emptied of its life. Uh, you know, animals, you know, know to get away before people do and, and they're, they're, they're running from the return of the deep six. And so we get, you know, this uh, Shalago, the flying fin back, uh, just this amazing, you know, action sequence. Reading this stuff as a young person, I was it's like, this is what I want to do. I want to make comics like this. It made a huge impression on me and set me on a path. Great panel here. You got three. How many, you know, sea monster designs do, does any one artist have at the ready? And so Kirby has like three very different, you know, variations on a theme that are each, you know, just just really exciting looking, just great action sequence with this uh, axe on a wire swinging around. Uh, Orion's jumping over it. He grabs the two guys, bonks their heads together. This is amazing comics. Wraps them up, throws them back. Now get off this ship. You're fouling the deck. And I do kind of wonder what would have happened, you know, had Kirby continued on this series. It's like, so... You know, we get this like battle with these like sea beasts and it's like, what's next? What was going to be next? Was it, you know, was there going to be some sort of, you know, sky beast, you know, some kind of, some kind of like flying, equi you know, air equivalent of the deep six that was going to create some kind of thing or, you know, was, was there going to be some kind of like underground, uh, you know, apocalypse crew, you know, creating some, some sort of you know, giant tunneling worm or whatever, like, again, through this series, Kirby like sets up these things where it's like, oh, we got a nice formula here where if you just continue that formula, you could milk this thing and keep it going. But he keeps changing the formula. He's a, he's a restless imagination. He's got a restless imagination. He wants to continually innovate. He doesn't want to rest on any one thing or, or, or be one note. And so he, he's continually subverting your expectations, which, you know, are just, it's just like the mark of a great storyteller. So, so obviously, so like those, those, uh, those ideas are probably, you know, whatever Kirby would have done, um, you know, th those ideas probably seem very pedestrian compared to what, what we never got, basically, so we'll never know. And so now the, 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 the ship is raining fire down on the deck. It's, it's on fire. Light rays tied Farley to the deck, you know, just for his own safety, but now, now the deck's on fire. Then we die. We die. Did Richard flinch? Did Richard run? No, I did. I did. I turned away. That fool light rays tied the old man to the mast. He won't have a chance if I don't free him. Hold, Orion. This final act will be over before the flames reach him. Come, you're mad, light ray. This is like one of my all-time favorite Kirby panels. It's just like great pop art. I love what's going on there. I love the perspective. You fight battles like a planner instead of a warrior. The enemy, myself, this dead boy and his father, we're all your pawns. Yet I've brought the enemy to us and see the face of the boy. He's changed like this room and is ready to join us in the confrontation. So, I mean, this is like one of those Kirby panels that could be a poster or be, you know, a full splash page. But, you know, Kirby's chosen his splash pages very carefully. So this, I mean, uh, and again, it's one of those sort of diagrammatic, it's as dramatic as it is, it's also diagrammatic. You've got the, the spawn, you've got the manta sled shooting down, uh, you know, flame, and you've got the the glory boat with, with uh, you know, instead of the mummy that was at the beginning of the story on the cover, now we got Farley Sheridan on the mast, like, like Odysseus. Apocalyptic, mythic, just big, big imagery. And now we have the bad guys and the good guys. We have the deep six. And now we, we get to see this guy for the first time, Pyron. So it's like Kirby's got, he's got a, he's, He's designed like a million different amazing things. He's got to design one more thing. This the sixth uh, member of the of this deep six that we haven't seen yet, Pyron, and there he is. Looks amazing as the glory boat. This is like the ship within the ship. The the husk, the outer husk of the boat, uh, sort of washes away, and out of it comes this new ship that was. Uh, created from the inside out, you know, that the, the sort of chrysalis and now, you know, the butterfly comes out. 
The sight of the enemy is an apocalyptic vision of terrifying dimensions. Their fury is focused on the ugly little wooden hulk from which emanates the Lorelei sound. Smash it, destroy it, leave no sign of its existence. It is the will of merciless gods. As if in answer to its attacker, the wooden ship blasts open. I really like the way Kirby uses the captions in this series. Um, they don't feel superfluous. They, they sort of, you know, complete the story. He's got 26 pages to work with here, more more than he, he usually has, but um, he's got to fit a lot of story in, and so so he uh, uses, uses the uh, narrative very effectively. And something inside rushes out into the calamitous night, singing and shining and sleek and deadly. What Light Ray has imprinted on the life cube is now fully grown, and it carries on its glistening warhead the living, the dead and the fiery trumpets of the source. If we must die, let new Genesis live. If we go to the source, you demons go with us. So we have this sort of God tech, this, this, this angel technology, this, you know, the, the martyred boy sort of, you know, draped over it. I don't know where Kirby's getting this stuff from. I mean, obviously, from the source, he's getting it from the source. He's getting it from deep within his own imagination, deep within the collective unconscious. He's mining deep and, you know, bringing out uh, revelation. The trumpets blast on impact with the enemy, thunderous notes, white hot, elemental, and all consuming, a Wagnerian offering to the source. And we get uh, magical flight uh, from the core of the Holocaust, another flash streaks for the skies. You did it, Light Ray. Only you could time escape at light speed. We've won. The Deep Six and their pet are gone. In such a blast, even I wasn't sure it would work, but it did. And yeah, I mean, you know, the landscape of superhero comics he creates a cast of characters and then uh you know they, they are summarily executed by the heroes of the story not uh you know it might be typical now or, or maybe it was typical you know 20 years ago or whatever but it was not typical in the late 60s early 70s kirby was you know just just creating something new something wonderful and and he's created a super war that, that, you know, this, this war of super beings, the stakes are just that much higher. And his, ma his imagination is up to the task. He knows that he can create characters and, and have them, you know, go to war with each other and, and have there be a, you know, be casualties because uh, there's more where that came from. Uh, unfortunately, he never really got the opportunity to provide, provide too many more because, you know, the series does not last long enough for there even to be the potential of a return of the Deep Six. And when daylight comes, what is left in the wake of grand tragedy is mere drifting wreckage. A young man of conscience has chosen a warrior's death. The old warrior has found new feelings in his suffering. What is man in the last analysis, his philosophy or himself? I'm alive, left to live out my life wondering. But Light Ray had gambled on this too. When the glory boat shot out of its wooden shell, the shell was backlashed far from the flaming area. Next, a mystery answered, the origin of Orion, the origin of Scott Free, Mr. Miracle. In one astounding moment, the secret that links them both is violently exposed. Read the pact. And when I first read this, I didn't know who Scott Free or Mr. Miracle was, but I was completely on board. A great comic, a great story, uh, one of the best ever made by by one of the best who, who's ever done it. I mean, this is, you know, put put this up there in the Hall of Fame of comics. And it's it's just a very satisfying read in and of itself. And then, you know, a really satisfying read as part of this, you know, continuum of the, of the New Gods stories and of the, the larger, you know, multi-book New Gods mythology. We have a reprint of The Manhunter. So we got a nice... Letters column, very, very uh, intelligent letters. And then this this is kind of a treat. I like this. Uh, here's the Space Age as imagined by Simon and Kirby in Real Fact Comics in 1946. So we get, you know, Simon and Kirby doing some, uh, you know, sci-fi, uh, you know, speculative science fiction. A department of science and invention, the rocket lanes of tomorrow. Perhaps not everyone will be able to afford a rocket mobile, but everyone will own a set of portable jets, inexpensive rocket tubes strapped to one's shoulders which will enable the wearer to soar leisurely aloft at medium speeds. 
Uh, I'm still waiting for mine. The miracle of jet propelled rockets will make possible cheap transportation of freight. Pilots will be able to blast off from rocket ports of the future to roar across the ocean at meteoric speed of 1,500 miles an hour. Inhabitants of desert regions will be able to receive fruits plucked from farms only a few hours previously. I like this one. That's, that's a pretty cool looking drawing. Explorers of the future, probably called Rocketeers, uh, trademark that. Uh, Jack Kirby, you know, not too long after this, did a, did a comic called The Three Rocketeers with Joe Simon. We'll span the gulf of space via jet propulsion to make the fanciful dreams of Jules Verne and other visionaries a reality. First the moon will be reached, next Mars. Planet after planet will be surveyed by future Columbuses of space. Here we see adventurers of tomorrow nearing Saturn, the ringed planet. I always love it when Kirby does space opera. New Gods is, you know, sort of solidly uh, within that genre. Transworld tunnels bored straight through the Earth's diameter will make possible trips across the globe at lightning flash speed. These super tubes, 8,000 miles from entrance to exit, will be roaring 24 hours a day with the rocket traffic of tomorrow's commerce. You know, it sounds like, you know, early thinking through of, of, you know, what Kirby would eventually make into the boom tube. This will be the greatest shortcut the world has ever known the end. So yeah, a great issue, great comic. Uh, Kirby has 26 pages to tell a story and uh, uses them very well. That extra real estate does not go to waste and and might be one of the contributing factors to why these stories are so extra special and, 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 you know, sort of stand out from, from, you know, just the the rest of comics history and, and, and the rest of, you know, Kirby's own body of work. Um, he was firing on all cylinders, loving what he was doing, creating the best work of his career. Uh, you know, possibly, you know, in my opinion, the, the, the best work that the medium has produced. And he's going to get punished <laughs> for it uh, not too long after this. The next one, uh, it, the next issue, uh, issue seven of New Gods, is my all-time favorite comic book. So I look forward to sharing that with you. I'm Tom Scholey author of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, and I Am Stan, which is available for pre-order in the show notes below. Uh, And if you follow that same link, you can also pre-order the softcover edition of Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. I'll see you next time for New God Sunday School.